So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to our session on the use and limits of uh, pragmatic HDA uh, methods and processes. My name is Rob Balterson. I'm a professor of global health economics at Radboud GMC in the Netherlands, and I'm chairing the session. The background to the session is that um, performing a full HDA may be beyond the time and uh, capacity available in many low middle income countries and um, more rapid and uh, simpler approaches may be required. And this work by the, uh, led by the uh, international, uh, by RDSI um, is an explicit recognition of this. And um, I much look forward to, uh, to see his further development. We have four speakers. Uh, first, we have a general introduction on the uh, concept of adaptive HDA and then we have three speakers uh, presenting case studies from Rwanda, India, and Pakistan. Uh, for purposes of interaction, we have uh, a Mentimeter poll. And um, of course, uh, you know, you can ask questions in the chat. And in the end, uh, there's also a time allocated to questions. So without uh, further ado, I'd like uh, to give the floor to, uh, to Kasi, Kasi Nensov who is a policy analyst at the uh, Center for Global uh, Development and uh, related to the uh, International Decision Support Initiative. So, Kasi, I hand over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Rob. Can I confirm that you can see my screen and hear me? Indeed. Very good. So I'll just take the first few minutes to go over, as Rob mentioned, the concept of adaptive health technology assessment. As he mentioned, um, my name is Kathy Nemzov. I work for the Center for Global Development in London, specifically supporting the International Decision Support Initiative, which is a Gates-funded initiative supporting priority setting in low and middle income countries. And so one of the concepts that we've been working to kind of develop and think through a bit more is what we've called adaptive HTA. And so to us, the issue in terms of working um, on priority setting in some low and middle income countries has been some are constrained by different issues, including capacity, data, time, and priority setting governance structures to carry out what we would call traditional HTA. So the likes of NICE in the UK, for example. And we think that there's a need to develop and test new approaches to HTA that address some of these constraints and are specific for low and middle income countries. And so, there are many different policy contexts where people have been adaptive or pragmatic in approaching HTA in different ways, but we've started with a paper um, in the BMJ Global Health about how we define adaptive HTA so that we can kind of take this thinking and this concept a bit further. We've defined it as a blanket approach for HTA methods and processes which are fit for purpose and focused on context specific practicality constraints. And what that means in practice is that the methods, for example, could make use or adapt available international methods or data or models from the literature, HTA agencies, to expedite evidence generation. And also that the processes around HTA, so not just the analytical methods of economic evaluation, but also the whole HTA process um, from topic identification to analysis to appraisal to implementation can be pragmatic, but still underscored by key HTA principles like transparency, independence, consultation, and contestability. So to iron this out a bit more clearly, what I've presented here is a table that we also had um, in the paper, which kind of illustrates what the differences between traditional and adaptive HTA might be. And I mean, I say illustrates very broadly because there's not clear cut definitions between them. And we've had many debates amongst each other about what the differences are. But broadly speaking, what you see on the left rows are the kind of steps of HTA that I mentioned and how we would maybe think about tradi more traditional HTA approaches versus adaptive and their trade-offs. So for example, adaptive HTA might take a slightly shorter timeline responding to policymaker demand for evidence faster. The topic selection process might not be as robust as it would be in a traditional HTA, or it may be particularly opportunistic. Analysis, as I mentioned, may make use of international data or literature reviews versus doing a kind of de novo economic evaluation. Data sourcing may be pragmatic. Appraisal may be modified or with a minimum uh, number of criteria. And implementation is really wide ranging. It depends on the technology. The way we think about it is there's different trade-offs between these two, right? We're trading off speed 
um, the level of comprehensiveness, local relevance, accuracy, and quality. And those trade-offs come with strengths and weaknesses for the adaptive HTA approach. So the way we see strengths and weaknesses of adaptive HTA or AHTA, we think that it allows policymakers to make quicker decisions may reduce the domestic analytical burden where there may not be a whole cutter of health economists ready to work on de novo analysis. It can offer evidence where there may otherwise be none at all. Um, it can quickly build capacity for stakeholders to understand the uses and, and levers for HTA. And it can also identify low hanging fruit, so highly cost effective or highly cost ineffective interventions, saving analytical capacity for locally specific questions that aren't necessarily have available data in other countries. On the other hand, weaknesses of AHTA type approaches might be that one, it's limited to topics where they've been well studied in other countries. And so data is available, but those countries may have different health system characteristics, which needs to be accounted for with appraisal expertise. And so that's where the whole HTA kind of process fits in to the spectrum is if we're going to leverage international data or models, we need to have enough um, appraisal expertise in order to review and contextualize that evidence and make an informed decision. It could also risk leading to suboptimal decision making if the information that's taken from AHTA isn't contextualized enough. And it may not build capacity needed for long term sustainability of HTA. And so we really see AHTA as kind of a tool in the toolbox of different approaches. And this exists in other countries in the world as well. For example, the Canadian HTA agency not only pulls out full HTAs, but they also have a whole suite of literature reviews, which they provide to policymakers to make decisions quickly. And so in conclusion, um, and just a warning, I will pull you on your thoughts on these methods um, following this slide. So just a heads up to wake you up this morning or evening, whatever time it is. Some of the recommendations that we made in the paper that we initially wrote were for different stakeholders in order to kind of advance this AHTA agenda a bit further. So, First, for HTA practitioners, publish more on AHTA methods, processes, and lessons learned. I think we see a lot of publications on methods for HTA and maybe processes, but less on lessons learned. How can we do this better? How can we be more pragmatic? We also believe researchers could develop, test, and validate a set of standardized approaches to AHTA for LMICs, leveraging some of those types of approaches I mentioned that already exist in other countries but developing a taxonomy and a standardized approach that's clear and easy to follow for different types of technologies. Policymakers could seek to leverage AHTA as one method for evidence-based priority setting, which will come through in a couple of presentations today. Clinicians could seek opportunities to incorporate AHTA evidence into clinical guidelines. And donors could support the uptake of AHTA evidence through investments in capacity building, model, and data sharing and databases. So for example, one great example is the Tufts database um, continuing that work and investing in building up that um, database further could be useful in trying to source data from other contexts. So I'll stop there. That's a very brief overview of AHT as it were. And I'm now going to share a Mentimeter um, poll, which I hope you can see. So at the top, it says you can go to menti.com and use the code, and then you can answer the question, which is, what do you believe are the implications of AHTA type approaches? So I mentioned some of the trade-offs um, and questions around AHTA, but would love to get some kind of initial feedback before we jump in more to the country examples of what do you think, what's your first impression? What do you think are the implications of using these type approaches and what are the things we should think about? So maybe I'll give people a couple minutes to go to the website and give your impressions. Presenters are also welcome to add their inputs. Yep. The final goal of suboptimal decisions, that's the biggest challenge maybe. Indeed, indeed, and that speaks to the issue of having strong appraisal and making sure that we're doing enough research to understand what the 
limitations are, the title of this topic, what the limitations are of approaching this in a different way. It's quicker, but should be embedded in careful process to safeguard legitimacy, absolutely. I think that definitely speaks to, and I think maybe Mariam will speak to it a bit more about the importance of process in the HTA decisions and that the evidence, the cost effectiveness and evidence is only one aspect of that. Lack of technical capacity of the understanding the purpose of AHTA and omics. Indeed, yes, um, we even are challenged by explaining AHTA in a broader sense. Um, but yes, I think HTA in general, HTA in general in low middle income countries is something that needs to be well explained and, and the uses of it and the limits of it really. Flexibility for LMIX and rapid evidence-based decision-making. Definitely the whole idea of HTA was born out of the, we need a decision to borrow or we need a decision next week. Um, but something that needs to be balanced with making sure that we don't make suboptimal decisions. Rapid research on low hanging fruit but reliance on existing literature may limit ability to important local problems. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so the idea is that hopefully in theory, important local problems would be able to be explored a bit more in detail whilst we can kind of pick off those low hanging fruits. Speed slash time is appealing, how to approach a stepping stone to more robust priority setting processes, definitely. We've talked a lot about kind of building up interim processes for AHCA and how we can build on those for the future to kind of develop, for example, fully robust process and methods guides like they have in the Philippines. Hopefully more HCA is being done instead of none, but obvious dangers of lower quality evidence and decision, indeed. It might reduce acceptance of HCA decisions due to higher uncertainty, but very tempting procedure. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Um, there's lots to navigate in terms of political process. I think I have maxed out five minutes for the Mentimeter poll and my presentation. So Robin may pass over to you and cut there, but thank you so much for those responses. Really useful and, and fruitful to think about these issues. Yeah, thanks, uh, Cassie. And uh, indeed, let's, uh, let's move on to the um, presentation on um, Rwanda by um, Dr. Solange Hakiba who is a chief of party from the USID Rwanda Integrated Health Systems Activity and former Deputy Director General of Benefits from the government of Rwanda. And um, so Solange, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Yes, this comes across uh, very well. You all see my screen now? Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rob. My name is Solange Akiba, and uh, I uh, work in Rwanda uh, in the USAID, uh, USAID Rwanda Health System Integrated System Activity. And I'm uh, presenting to you today what we did in Rwanda in terms of comparing both the um, peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. So this is a pilot study on cost effectiveness, rapid assessment on PD versus HD with patients in, uh, that have AKI in Rwanda. So what's happening in Rwanda exactly? We have dialysis services being given and uh, these, the provision happens uh, in the public facilities as well as in the private facilities. The private sector engagement in health is still very shy, I would say, where we only have one specific uh, investor in health, uh, in, uh, in uh, dialysis services, but that investor has been facilitated by the government of Rwanda to also, in addition to its own private practice, to also set up uh, dialysis wings in some uh, district hospital in the rural uh, sector. So we have three centers that do provide dialysis services and they're all at this point hemodialysis services. In the public uh, sector, we mainly have the referral hospital that have availed these services and the patients are actually uh, 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 accessing it with the King Faisal Hospital being the highest referral, referral hospital that will also manage the very few patients that are allowed on uh, peritoneal dialysis and mainly the young children or those patients that are under four, uh, 40 kgs of weight. 
So how is this, this uh, uh, covered in Rwanda? Uh, Rwanda has a population of uh, around 13 million uh, uh, people and uh, 80 to 82 percent of those uh, at that population is actually already covered by the community-based health insurance that has a package on uh, um, uh, dialysis, but specifically for acute kidney injuries. And that benefit package for AKI treatment covers only six weeks of treatment or a, a total of 18 sessions that will, uh, if this is a reversible um, kidney injury, should be able to reverse the situation. So how are those services being uh, um, organized in the facilities? The uh, Rwanda Medical Supply Limited Company uh, is a government institution, semi-private institution, that procure most of the drugs that are necessary for the uh, hemodialysis, all the hemodialysis kits. And uh, more and more we have the, 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 the private uh, supplier coming in. So what we did here was to really see how we can improve the access, uh, uh, study the cost effectiveness, but also the budget implication uh, um, uh, of moving for, from hemodialysis to peritoneal dialysis. And we looked at this uh, with a third uh, analysis on costing that we will be, dis uh, that another uh, discussant will be sharing. But at this moment, we're going to mainly share about the cost effectiveness analysis as well as the budget impact analysis. So, what was the question at stake here? The issue was can a modalysis, uh, uh, is a modalysis or peritoneal dialysis? Uh, uh, more for dialysis eligible uh, AKI patients, more cost effective or not. We had shared the experience of various facility, uh, countries where we saw that PD could be a solution, but was it applicable in Rwanda? And then more important assumption was, um, are, there, are there only the two relevant treatment options that were available and could uh, PD be delivered both in the facility and why not even in the community? but we mainly uh, stuck with analyzing what can be done at facility level. So what did we find out, out of our rapid assessment is mainly that uh, um, when we looked at the cost effectiveness, effectiveness analysis, the HD was slightly more effective and slightly more costly than the PD, which we already knew based on uh, the experience we had uh, heard from other countries. But HD, cost effective uh, for the payer perspective. So here, we need to be uh, 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 reminded that we were mainly looking coming from a payer perspective and not yet a patient perspective. Of course, uh, peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis is preferred in different scenarios when it's, uh, the patient is older, when there's an uh, issue of societal perspective for everyone, and uh, the uh, hemodialysis was more uh, um, applied on patients between 15 and 49 years old. So we realized that through this uh, assessment, decreasing the cost of hemodialysis kits to the level of some of the best purchasing facilities in the country would also actually make hemodialysis more cost effective across the board. So the idea was, if we can have procure better, then maybe we can institutionalize and even increase the number of sessions. And the other uh, uh, aspect was uh, the uncertainty, the uncertainty uh, around the peritoneal dialysis setting in the country. This is a whole new adventure and it has not been done yet. So there was an initial cost of setting up or creating the possibility for the PD services to be available in the country. And on, in addition to those, we had also the training. So even if PD was, seemed to be a good solution, it was also coming with a, a, an initial cost of setting up the services, training, and it, can, it could only become cost effective uh, in the long run. So when we look at the budget impact analysis, here again, um, we look into 
both the payer perspective, but also the provider perspective, the, the, the patient perspective that need to be more uh, uh, digged into because this is an area that was not a, we were not able to, 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 to look into because of the lack of uh, uh, available data that would be the basis of our, our analysis. So in a nutshell, more money could be saved by reducing the cost of hemodialysis kits than actually starting by all in all shifting to uh, peritoneal dialysis at a rate of 5% or even 10% per year because we expect that we'll be gaining more immediately by reducing the cost of uh, uh, hemodialysis that is already available in the country. Of course, we had uh, a lot of uh, discussion around what can this uh, tell us or not? But I would like to summarize here saying the most important aspect of this rapid assessment was that we had to go look for the data and most of the data were not available. So this work was done with really the, available, the data available at hand and looking into improving this analysis when we move further. So what are we doing? What are we uh, giving as advice to uh, the uh, payer? that is the Rwanda Social Security Board, but also the Ministry of Health, is to set up a way in the short term to negotiate the prices of the hemodialysis kits to, make, uh, to improve the effectiveness of, those, uh, of that hemodialysis. Of course, in, on, in addition to negotiating the prices, we had to we look into negotiation of the tariff. Medium term. One minute, uh, Solange. Sorry, I had put on the timer and it blew up on me. Sorry about that. And then on middle term, it's really going back into improving the data that we are working with to make sure that we are uh, uh, analyzing and giving the right uh, information to the uh, decision makers and the, the, for the eventual uh, policy changes. So uh, we had, I, I mentioned the strength and the limitation there was a strong will to change the, 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 the way the patients are accessing, the way the services are being given. Uh, the analysis could be completed, had, had been completed in a very short time, but data was still something that we need to be done. Most of the activities are being manually given. So uh, we're looking to really improving the data, going institutionalizing the HTA so that as this was actually the first HTA in Rwanda, so I think it's a, it was a real uh, adventure and all the people were very excited to sit around the same table, both from the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Health and the Payer the Rwanda Social Security Board to come in and say, how are we improving the benefit package and how are we responding to the demand of our population? Thank you very much. And I think we can share more during the question and answer. Thank you, over to you, Rob. Excellent, uh, Solange, and I think this is a perfect match with the uh, overall theme, the adaptive health technology assessment, and what you can achieve in uh, with limited time and uh, and capacity. And uh, well, I think don't think you should be over modest in what you have achieved. Uh, but let's talk about that later on. Um, second presentation is on um, work in India by uh, Dr. Hiral Shah, senior policy analyst from the. Uh, Center for Global Development and uh, International Decision Support Initiative. Yuval, floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rob. Can you hear me and see, and see my screen? Yes, excellent. Brilliant. So I have about seven and a half minutes to try and pitch and showcase what we're trying to do in India. And so, you know, I think quite a few people might have seen some of these graphs, um, but cancer is becoming a growing burden and will become a large burden of uh, and an issue in India over time. Um, you can see in some of these graphs over time, you know, the burden of um, cancer or the incidence is increasing. You can see historically in the middle sort of maps, it's increased across all states. But at the same time, there's been a rise in treatment costs um, with almost three to four times an increased cost for the five common cancers. Now, this is obviously against a backdrop where India is trying to achieve universal health coverage and it's um, set out an ambitious um, social insurance scheme, which is looking to provide healthcare insurance for over 40% of its population. Now, that becomes an issue, obviously, because, you know, there's a limited 
uh, reimbursement rate within that scheme, but cancer is such a big problem and it costs a lot. And so an institution uh, named the National Cancer Grid in India um, actually reached out to us and they're a network of up to 40, of up to, sorry, 230 hospitals across India. And they provide 60% of the oncology care in India. And their main mandate is to provide uniform cancer care across the country. And they've sort of realized that, you know, currently as part of their clinical guidelines, they need to start incorporating um, cost effectiveness evidence, but these clinical guidelines that they develop will be by, by extension, hopefully be informing any sort of benefits packages that are going to be used for this national health insurance scheme um, in India. And so they came out to us telling us, we can't do formal HTA because we have too many indications. It takes too much time and we're clinicians, what do we do? And that's where the idea of adaptive HTA really was born in that they want to try and include adaptive HTA into their clinical guidelines, which then can inform quality standards and indicators and therefore health benefits plans and packages. And so Cassie has obviously gone through quite a few of the different sort of um, things that adaptive HTA can do. And the idea over here is that we leverage or adapt available uh, evidence from international contexts on safety, effectiveness and cost effectiveness to inform um, oncology policy or decision-making by these clinicians and then hopefully by extension on the health benefits packages and also pricing. Um, just to point out that, as Cassie mentioned, there's no globally recognized standard form of care. So we are really sort of trying to build the plane as we go along and improve as we go along. So it's very much an incremental approach. And the sort of idea that we've taken in um, India with the National Cancer Grid is that we select priority oncology drugs or indications these are, you know, indications that are either costing a lot or they're high use um, or sort of there's a large burden of disease. Um, we look at certain information on the sort of whether it's an old drug, a generic, whether it's a new patented drug, uh, what's the pricing mechanisms involved. Um, and then we perform a rapid assessment of safety, effectiveness and cost effectiveness evidence um, based on international benchmarks. So we look at other HTA agencies that have conducted the same sort of um, HTA for the same indications and assess whether that information is translatable to a local Indian context or not. And then because it's drugs um, and because certain prices might be available, we then use a price analysis to compare how much more or less India might be paying compared to these international benchmarks. So either compared to the UK or the USA, Thailand, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, where prices are available. And then the idea is to appraise that evidence and provide some sort of recommendation on the potential cost effectiveness. And so just to, just to highlight that we do this through either sort of rapid and targeted literature reviews that focuses either on HTA agencies, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, cost effectiveness analyses, or even international clinical guidelines. And we focus on extracting sort of safety, clinical effectiveness, cost effectiveness, cost evidence, but also the uncertainty involved in all of this, the data, decision-making, and the methods. And we still try to bring in some of the evidence-based medicine approach of the PICO framework, the double-reviewed sort of idea so that mistakes are sort of catered for and that there's validity in our process, and that is qualitatively appraised by sort of the experts, really. And so this is just an example of the sort of pricing analysis where we um, conducted for one drug. And if you Take, a, take the example that this drug costs about 190,000 rupees in India, right? And it costs about 5,260 pounds in the UK. So we're looking at the first row. And we use the GDP per capita as a benchmark um, where we basically calculate how much more or less is the benchmark, is, is the Indian GDP compared to the UK GDP. We then convert the Indian price of 190,000 to the UK price. And we use this adjustment factor, which is calculated by looking at the, 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 the difference in GDP or the ratio in GDP from the India to benchmark to create an adjustment factor. And we calculate how much more the UK price, which is 5,260, would need to come down by using this adjustment factor to reflect an Indian context, which would be, it would need to come down to about 568 pounds. Whereas the converted Indian price, just by converting in ex exchange rates, is 1,944. And therefore we can see that the price is almost, India is paying currently 3.42 times more than the UK for the same drug in the same indication. 
And so One this minute. provides, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll just be finishing off. Um, this provides some evidence as opposed to for decision making, as opposed to no evidence when you know, decision makers are going to these committees or un undergoing price negotiations with pharmaceutical companies without any evidence. Um, we also do a sort of annual budget calculation to elicit what would be the annual sort of per patient or per cohort cost. And this culminates in a sort of policy brief that the idea is to make it transparent for the public, but also for decision makers and for any sort of private or public stakeholders as well. And that's embedded in the HTA sort of mandate of transparency. And just to sort of conclude that, you know, there's obviously many trade-offs that Cassie mentioned with adaptive HTA, but decisions will be taken and still need to be taken with or without evidence. And the idea is that it's better to have a little bit of evidence when where you know, rather than no evidence. And as, as Cassie mentioned, it can help filter out extremely expensive or extremely cost-saving or highly cost-effective interventions. It's not a replacement for a traditional HTA, but we are finding in India with the NCG that, you know, it's initial steps and it's an incremental approach towards fully institutionalizing HTA in, in this institution and hopefully in the country. And you can see some next steps on the right over there that we want to validate what we're doing. Uh, we want to improve the HTA ecosystem through capacity building and training and sort of create a sustainable process and methodology here. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Iwal. Very nice overview of the project. Uh, uh, we move on to the third uh, presenter, um, who is uh, Dr. Mariam Huda, who is a medical doctor, public health professional, and a PhD scholar in health economics, Department of Community Health Sciences from Aga Khan University in Pakistan. Mariam, floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, so, uh, hello, everyone. I will be talking about the development of universal health coverage benefit package in Pakistan. Uh, so, Disease Control Priorities 3 provides evidence on the most cost-effective interventions across low- and middle-income countries, and Pakistan is one of the first countries to adopt the DCP3 for designing its universal health coverage benefit package. For development of the UHCBP, a six-step evidence-informed deliberative process, the EDP, was used. Methods in each step are based on relevant theories and best practices from health technology assessment bodies around the world. So the first step was installation of an advisory committee. The DCP3 Secretariat conducted planning, assessment, and political work in capacity building jointly with the Ministry of Health and the Khan University. There were four technical working groups uh, with more than 100 stakeholders in total from four clusters, which are the reproductive, maternal, neonatal, child, adolescent, health, and nutrition, the non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, and the health services access. So they prioritized the interventions for implementation and provided recommendations to the UHCBP, um, to the uh, National Advisory Committee, the NAC, and the NAC sent its recommendation to the Steering Committee, which is chaired by the Minister of Health for Endorsement. An international advisory group uh, also advised the Steering Committee. And finally, the Interministerial Health and Population Forum approved the essential package of health services. So to define the decision criteria for prioritization of interventions, a survey monkey was conducted with all the relevant stakeholders, and the results were more or less the same for all these eight criteria you can see here. So subsequently, evidence was generated regarding burden of disease, cost effectiveness, and budget impact for the EDPs. Uh, the next step was to prioritize interventions from the DCP3 UHCBP, which is composed of 218 interventions uh, in 21 packages across these four clusters, as well as the 71 intersectoral interventions. Uh, these are the intervention descriptions, and they were prepared for each individual intervention detailing the inputs necessary for service delivery per patient per year. So, for instance, staff requirements, drug regimens, laboratory-based diagnostics, radiology, other supplies and equipment. They were developed based on the latest existing national guidelines and expert opinion from the senior clinicians across the country. Uh, for calculating population sizes for each intervention, we use sources like census, national service, and program data, and applied the GBD, the Global Burden of Disease 2017 data, to arrive at the population in need for each intervention. 
Now, to uh, develop a context-specific rapid method to cost the DCP3 interventions, we carried out a normative ingredients-based costing, assuming a provider's perspective and using a one-year time frame. So there were different steps. The first step was development of uh, a semi-automated user-friendly costing template in Microsoft Excel. Next was development of intervention description sheets that I talked earlier about. And then identification of the price sources was carried out. Since there were a variety of price sources available for each input, therefore a hierarchy of price sources by input was established. And finally, the price data was extracted. Um, for interventions in the first four levels, that is the community level, primary health care, first level, and referral hospitals, we used a bottom-up approach and calculated unit costs for interventions by estimating the resources needed and relevant prices per beneficiary. For example, cost per person treated for hypertension over a year. Uh, and then we assessed the total spending per intervention and budget impact. For the population level interventions, uh, we used a top-down approach. As these interventions were fixed at the national level, a total national cost was estimated and a unit cost, cost per person reach, was then derived by dividing the total cost by the target population. So in the end, a total of 170 DCP3 interventions were costed and 199 unit costs were calculated. For assessing ISAs, the incremental cost effectiveness ratios, we adopted a seven step process. So firstly, we formed a team of five members with country specific knowledge, a combined experience in health economics, research and clinical practice. Then all these team members familiarized themselves with interventions uh, being considered for the benefit package. Uh, then we use CEA literature to review potential matches for the Pakistan-specific DCP3 interventions. And as Cassie mentioned, we use the Tufts Medical School Global Health Cost Effectiveness Analysis Registry for this as a search engine. Uh, then we did a general knockout criteria and a specific knockout criteria uh, focusing uh, on intervention description and how well it matched the description provided by the Ministry of Health. And finally, we used a three-star scoring system. Uh, so here, uh, at the time of undertaking this exercise, the GHCA registry had 5,597 entries, and after applying the rounds of knockout criteria, we arrived at the partial and uh, exact matches that you can see on your left. Um, so for assessing the quality of the evidence, uh, three stars uh, was an evidence from Pakistan, two stars was an evidence from South Asia or other LMICs, and one star was given to the interventions whereby we could not find a match, and uh, we used the uh, default ISA values that were pre-populated within the tool that we used, the HIP tool. Um, so the uh, optimization analysis was done uh, in the HIP tool to get the output to calculate budget impact, cost per capita, and DALIs awarded. Uh, now this slide shows the whole uh, process summary whereby evidence on uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratios, unit cost, burden of disease, population in need, and current and target coverages were optimized in the HIP tool uh, to give outputs such as budget impact, cost per capita, and DALIs averted, and these investment cascades. And this output was then presented to evidence summary sheets for assessment, as I will show you in the upcoming slide. So this is an example of an evidence summary sheet for one intervention. Such sheets were developed for more than 180 interventions, and we used the traffic signal lights to indicate low, medium, and high priority as red, yellow, and green, respectively, as you can see here. So four scenarios were developed, which showed the cumulative optimized spending of interventions per year at pre-specified coverage rates for four different snapshots. So at year two, year five, year 10, and then 80% target um, rates uh, in line with the sustainable development goals. One minute so for left, a, okay, I'll Thank be you. done in that. So for appraisal by NAC and uh, steering committee, six different implementation scenarios were developed, keeping in view the number of interventions, the cost of package, and the per capita cost. And finally, uh, the Interministerial Health and Population Forum approved a district level package, which combined the community level, PHC level, and first level hospital interventions. And they are composed of 88 interventions with a cost of uh, $13 per capita per year. And there were also additional 13 interventions through special initiatives like uh, nutrition, hepatitis, and HIV. Etc. Uh, so, um, within a limited policy time frame, we developed a pragmatic method that partially localized evidence, highlighted evidence gaps, and promoted extensive local deliberation, though we had considerable challenges given the underlying weak and biased database. So, in conclusion, our work highlights the central importance of developing local evidence generation and deliberative uh, processes as a precursor to defining UHC benefit packages going forward. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much.
Excellent, Miriam. Excellent. Um, so thanks. So we heard three presentations on um, adaptive uh, HTA. It's not a formal term to cover all the presentations, but I see it as a kind of an overall method uh, that needs to be developed further by now taking the lead by RDSI on how to match um, the requirements for good data with the limitations available in the capacity and the time in um, in many low-income uh, countries. Um, I hand over again to Cassie, who is going to run uh, another Mentimeter. Cassie, please. Great. Give me one second to share my screen again. Can you see my screen? Yes, indeed. Great. OK, so if you go back to the same website um, with the same code, it's now on a different slide with a different question um, to get a few inputs. I think there was one I flipped over and somebody added for the last question. Um, but the question is, what are your reflections on these methods, and how would you change them? And maybe while people are typing, I'll just read out the last um, response to the last question. Need to consider carefully which shortcuts merely make evidence more uncertain slash approximate and which critically undermine reliability. Yes, indeed, that's absolutely a great point. Um, and I think there's more work that needs to be done, particularly from HTA experts about exactly that. Which parts do critically undermine reliability versus which where can we make shortcuts to make it easier and faster? Would be nice what the authors would change. <laughs> Maybe we can, Rob, I'll bounce that one to you for um, uh, Q&A or maybe a round from the presenters. Further shortcuts. Uh, imperfect but practical. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, <laughs> particularly if the aim is to institutionalize more HTA capacity with the government of LMIX who may not have the time evidence bandwidth to do a full HTA. Yes, indeed. I quite like the do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. <laughs> uh, include methods that consider trade-offs across different criteria. Yes, indeed. Uh, Rob can probably talk about that a bit more. Uh, is there a difference in the use of AHTA between LIX and MIX? Excellent question. Um, yes, I think there is. Um, I think it's, it's different across the board, but I think there's the need to review what AHTA methods exist, even in HICS as well. Um, and what does that mean? And also, the question is also, you know, what do we do with this evidence at the end? Here all highlighted, you know, we'll, we'll potentially integrate that evidence into clinical practice in India. Um, but there's a the question about, you know, would different methods result in different policy implications in the end and different translation of policy? Uh, I think if I hit enter, it will stop scrolling. Yeah. Uh, is there space for more comprehensive models? Building infrastructure to track local costs can be one expensive and two time consuming, especially for new innovative treatments. The evidence might take a long time to become sufficient. Yes, I think there is space for comprehensive modeling. Maybe this doesn't answer the question completely, but I think the, the point is maybe to think about where is AHTA most useful and where are comprehensive models needed and relevant in order to invest that time in tracking local costs, um, which are expensive, which is expensive and time consuming. And how quickly does a policymaker need an answer? Um, one of the interesting questions we once got was, what do we do about palliative care in low income countries? And that's not something that's well studied at all. And so if that's an important question to policymakers, makers, maybe that's worth exploring more. I see. Can I propose um, that we move on to the um, discussant. Yes, uh, indeed. This is a very nice, uh, nice set of reactions and um, we can extend the discussion um, after we heard from the discussant, who is uh, Shankar Prinja, from, uh, who is additional professor of health economics 
at the Postgraduate Institute of uh, Medical Education and Research in India. So, um, Dr. Shankar, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to all the speakers for excellent set of presentations. I think it's been a great session so far with uh, Casey beginning to give us a very broad overview of what what adaptive HTA you know space looks like. And then we've got very good three examples from three different settings, three different countries, Rwanda, India, and Pakistan. Uh, I think the, the thing that struck me from the Rwandan presentation was the, the approach of rapid assessment that informed very critically on an, on an issue that the policymakers keep grappling, and that's, uh, that's the uh, price negotiation and informing what should be the most appropriate prices. So that's particularly uh, one thing that really struck me. I, I mean, I, I do not necessarily need to overemphasize the importance of uh, doing HT in the field of oncology coming from India, especially where we do understand that uh, the cost of treating oncology patients, et cetera, is, is so overwhelming. And then the, the need for uh, looking at more efficient mechanisms for treatment uh, is, is certainly in need of the R. Given the, uh, given the volume of questions or decision problems that are there in, in front of us, to either frame standard treatment guidelines or to, to inform the, uh, the, the health benefit package decisions for the insurance programs. I certainly do believe that uh, the full HTS perhaps would take a long, long time frame, and definitely the policy decisions would still keep happening. So I do feel that there is definitely a scope at least to inform in the time being. But, and, and then we had the, the, the presentation from Pakistan and Mariam gave a very, very uh, good overview of, the, of the, the assessment that they used using the global evidence as well as the local uh, data that they collected on costs in order to inform the a very huge exercise, I think, that's on benefit package. Overall, my impressions is that uh, if you look at the what is the overall relevance of adaptive HTA, I had a few points perhaps that uh, could be relevant. One is that I, I feel that there is more of relevance of use of adaptive HTAs in context where the decision problems are much more straightforward and single in nature. When you have multiple complex decision problems, the extent to which perhaps an, ad an adaptive HTA may inform decisions uh, becomes less and less because more and more uncertainties start to come up. And that's where perhaps there is a more of a scope that I see for, for adaptive HTA to, to inform decisions around drugs and the procurement of drugs. But I feel that it perhaps may be more of a challenge when we're looking at uh, co complex issues like uh, health programs or delivery strategies or, or even medical devices as well because how do we do price benchmarking and other things is going to be a challenge. And then the coverage rates for different uh, programs for interventions might vary from, and the context might vary from one country to another country. Second, I also do feel that uh, an adaptive HTA also perhaps may have a role to play as a precursor of a full HTA, if, if I may say so, especially in the, in the stage of let's say topic selection or scoping where you could actually put aside things that are pretty obvious, as uh, Casey was trying to mention in earlier as well, that things that are pretty much cost effective on very high end of the spectrum or very cost ineffective are things that would come straight forward in the in an in a adaptive HTA approach using some rapid assessment methods as well. So that's something that is also going to be a potential tool with the agencies that are uh, that are managing the HTA process in different countries to sort of scope the, uh, the questions. And the third I feel is the, the scope that I feel for the adaptive HTA is around identifying the, the, the areas where you have really uh, scarcity of data, identifying data needs that could then build on more uh, you know, studies to, to fill up that evidence gap. I would again come back to the comment that Hiral made about that the, the fact that it, the adaptive HTA is not something that is going to substitute the, the full HTA. It's not going to replace a full HTA, and I completely agree with him. Uh, but I do also feel that maybe some examples of adaptive HTA, where you can actually generate an evidence much more in real time as much as is the need of the policymakers to ensure that decisions ultimately get uh, informed through the evidence, and that in a way also encourages the, 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 the use of evidence for policymaking and brings in this culture of using evidence that again is sort of 
conducive for the overall application of HT as well. In terms of the way forward, I feel that there is definitely, given the kind of range of comments that we also were receiving in the Mentimeter, where people did have their own set of uh, doubts or, or concerns about the, the robustness of uh, use of adaptive HTA, I think one of the ways that definitely comes in future is doing some kind of uh, uh, validation studies to compare the evidence that comes in from uh, an adaptive HTA and compare that against a full HTA. And I know that Hiral and uh, colleagues are also working around that to try and demonstrate what's the extent of validity of the evidence that comes through uh, a rapid HTA. And that helps to demonstrate uh, the, the risks and benefits that come along with the application of adaptive HTA in a much more empirical and transparent manner. So I think I'll stop here and maybe hand it over to you, Rob. Thank you, Shankar. Very nice uh, comments. And I, um, I'd like to open the floor for, um, for a broader um, discussion. We've got 10 minutes left. And um, let me first invite the, uh, the speakers if they have any reactions to the comments from, uh, from Shankar. So Hiral, Cassie, Miriam, Solange, if you have any brief responses. Yeah, I, th I think, yes. Yeah, so th thank you, Rob, and thank you, Sh uh, Dr. Shankar. I think um, I agree with everything Dr. Shankar was um, mentioning, actually. And for for us that are working in India on, and with the NCG, 100% um, agreed it can be used as topic selection and um, sort of all the other uses that uh, Dr. Shankar said. But I think the, the thing that we also want to stress is that we shouldn't lose the goal of institutionalization of HDA and also the full HDA methods. In that that's always the end goal, right? How you get there is is obviously a, a longer journey, and AHT is part of that process. But the idea is still that you know by the end of it there should be some sort of like appropriate and robust institutionalization with the full HTA framework as well. Thank you. Hino. I also yeah. agree with Dr. Shankar. Uh, thank you, Rob. So I completely agree with Dr. Shankar. I think this was the experience that we saw in Pakistan that it it becomes so important at times when you firstly produce the culture of doing uh, you know uh, evidence informed decision making, and it becomes really important in in countries like us where you know there was no culture like this before. And secondly, the long process of HTA. If you can't do that, I think the adaptive HTA helps you uh, um, you know do these uh, rapid quick methods and still evidence informed uh, where you can have uh, successful policies uh, the way we had in Pakistan. It was one of the uh, policies which was the most successful ones where I saw uh, evidence converting into policy was uh, this experience of ours. So I, I would agree with Dr. Shankar. Thank you. Um, can I add something also? Thank you very much everyone and I agree with all your inputs. I think also for our uh, setting, and I think it also works for, for all the different countries, this HTA bring an opportunity because health is a priority. It brings an opportunity for, for all the stakeholders to come together and discuss. The Ministry of Finance doesn't feel like they are uh, stakeholders in, 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 in health. They feel like once they have given you the you allocated budget, they are off the hook. And you need to, you know, cover the whole, all the package, benefit package with that small amount of money they gave you. But it's not the case. But when you go and institutionalize an HTA, you bring the researchers, the finance people, the health people together, and you are able to really discuss that, those priority and the financial burden that comes with those services that are, are, are delivered in, in the population. So I think it's an amazing opportunity to bring all the stakeholders together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Solange. And um, can I open up the floor to, to others? And you can use the chat or you can wave your hand if you like to speak out. If there is no question, I, I have a question to uh, to Cassie, maybe also to others involved in the adaptive health technology assessment. If I think about its further development, I see a risk that the focus will be too much on the uh, data collection and how can you best organize it with limited capacity? How can you best uh, transfer ISOs? And I think there's lots to be gained if we focus also on the process in, in two things, two parts. Firstly, 
to do a proper scoping exercise as the lines also indicated. So upfront, consult stakeholders and see what data needs to be collected in order to have a good, um, to make a good decision. It can save you lots of work in developing I have a very advanced decision analytical model and maybe there's this is not needed and there is no question on the cost effectiveness. So you can skip that whole part. So a good scoping is necessary. Uh, and secondly, I think it's good to, um, to organize your appraisal phase because I think incomplete data is unavoidable in high income countries, low income countries everywhere. So that's as a principle, we need to think in your appraisal phase how to deal with incomplete data, which is a given. And I think Maryam showed in Pakistan that um, the appraisal phase was well organized with um, indications of uncertainty around the estimates. And then the appraisal committee, the technical working groups and the NAC were basically appraising the evidence in the light of the incompleteness. And um, so I think we need to accept that data is incomplete and have a very good structured appraisal phase to work around it in order to uh, achieve um, acceptable decisions by the uh, by the stakeholders and to achieve uh, legitimacy. So um, that's basically my, my question to, to, to Cassie. Like, do you agree that we shouldn't only focus on assessment, but also be wise on scoping and appraisal? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think as health economists, we tend to think about um, HTA and CEA interchangeably sometimes, and that's really easy to say HTA is cost effectiveness analysis, but it's not it's much broader process. Um, I think what needs to be done in terms of building up that process, and I know there's some work underway, is like you said, scoping out the question and also starting the scoping with what do you want to do with this analysis and making sure that, that whatever the topic is and the analysis is and that the, the praise and the recommendations are made, then what do we do to actually affect change? And that's something that's um, preoccupied me quite a bit. In terms of the appraisal process, um, it would be great to collaborate more um, and dig up a lot more details on what the appraisal process could look like, um, because we know a very formalized appraisal processes, of course, from NICE and others. But um, creating a more pragmatic approach to that is something that we need to do a bit more thinking on, I think, in terms of, I think, to one of the Mentimeter comments, where can we cut, cor cut corners effectively and what do we absolutely need? And I think one of the things I learned from the Pakistan experience, maybe not in this presentation, but elsewhere is, you know, not everything needs to be measured very specifically, but we need to at least agree on what we're going to consider and how that's going to be structured. And I think that requires a bit of thinking about what the process looks like, but also working with the right stakeholders to train them on how to appraise evidence um, and how to make those recommendations. And I think that's the work of health economists and the people working on HTA to do. So absolutely, um, I'd love to see a very balanced process in H HTA between methods and processes because I think they're absolutely interlinked. And this, I like this phrase, the culture of evidence um, use. I think it's really important. I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, thanks, Cassie. One minute left for a short question from um, from Tommy, please. Hi, hi all. Thanks, and yes, I see oh, we're at time, so but can I just throw this little idea in there? So just challenging Cassie, your your definition of adaptive HTA as a blanket approach for HTA methods process, which are fit for purpose uh, and based on context specific practicality considerations. Therefore, those that are not adaptive would they be not fit for purpose? So perhaps with our terminology, are we looking at sort of nice methodology as um, as not so much if it's not Fit for purpose, then, 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 then what is it? Is it sort of impractical HDA um, it, that's been done at the, at the high income level, uh, high income country level? If they're spending 500,000 uh, pounds per decision, um, um, should that be something that the countries are, are aiming for? And, and whether we want to call the uh, practical HDA that you're proposing as just HDA um, and the high income country impractical as some sort of terminology like impractical HDA. Just an idea to throw in there, um, uh, maybe tongue in cheek, but, but just. I want to get at that idea of, you know, we, we've got to do what's what's the country can achieve and, and not sort of uh, berate ourselves if we can't achieve this this extremely expensive um, HDA um, that's just impractical for, for many countries. Um, over. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, and uh, for sharing this uh, food for thought. Um, can I propose that those who want to um, continue the discussion remain in the um, in the Zoom session and we formally close the um, the overall session now? I'd like to thank the um, 
the presenters excellent presentations within the short time frame um that's uh, that's incredible and thank you uh Shanka, for your contribution and thanks for all um uh participants for joining and um well i'm looking forward to the further development of a hta so thanks everybody and uh, hope to see you soon again bye thank so. you bye thank you bye -bye. thank you bye bye thanks mm. Uh, this is the formal closure, I think. So thanks, um, Miriam and Solange. Yeah. Within eight minutes, thanks, we've done the whole project. That's, Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. Thank you so much, Rob, for your yeah. moderation. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Yeah. Okay, bye.